our next speaker is uh, Dr. Josh Pierce, uh, and Josh is going to talk about uh, 3D printing and open systems. And Josh comes to us, as, like I said, from Michigan Techno Technological University in Oten, Oten, Michigan, which I have no idea where that is, but it's cold. It's cold. Okay. Um, uh, at, at Michigan uh, Tech, he runs the Open Sustainability Lab dedicated to the use of open source technology to find collaborative solutions to problems in sustainability and poverty reduction. So please welcome Dr. Josh Pierce. Thank you very much. You got it, sir. Hey, hi, everybody. And it's nice to be, uh, really nice to be here. It's nice, warm, <laughs> and cozy. Um, so I'm going to change gears a little bit from our last speaker. Uh, which kind of gave you the, I, I think, a very good introduction to the high-end proprietary world of 3D printing. And what I'm going to talk about is the open source, the low end, if you have no money, can you still participate in this? And specifically, I'm going to look at applying it to scientific tools. Uh, what we know that 3D printers are very good for making things that are custom, that are made for just one use. And in both in medicine and in science, those custom products are extremely expensive. It's, it doesn't fit into the standard manufacturing paradigm. And that's where 3D printing is really powerful. Uh, so first, I, I know many of you are familiar with open source as it relates to the software world. I'm going to talk about how it can relate to the hardware world, show you how kind of this open source lab technology actually works, and then run through a whole slew of examples that will hopefully touch on everybody in the room, and you'll find something that will be useful to you. So first, open source hardware. When we say open source, what we're talking about is the code, the underlying actual code that makes up software. But just as there's open source software, there's open source hardware. So for hardware, the code is the design schematics, the electric, electrical wiring diagrams, the materials that go into something. Now, in open source software, when, when it occurred, what we saw was an, an extremely rapid increase in innovation. And you say, well, why is that? Well, if you're working for one company on a specific software package, you have to work within sort of the con confines of that company. You're only allowed to use certain intellectual property. You want to build off the stuff that your company has already designed. You can't go out and reach, you can't spread your arms wide and use anybody's work. Well, in the open source world, you spread your arms really wide. And so you have hundreds or possibly thousands of people collaborating on a project that might, will probably never even see each other. And that gives you a distinct advantage. It allows you to much more quickly innovate. And we saw that in software. So right now, Everyone in, in this room that uses a computer or the internet uses open source software all the time. Facebook, Amazon, Google, all of them run open source on the back end. Now part of it is the cost point. Open source software sort of by definition is free. It's, it's free to, you can, you're free to hack it, you're free to change it, you're free to sell it, you're free to do basically whatever you want with it. And there's only one aspect of it that makes it sort of sustainable, and that's that there's a viral aspect. If you use this free code, you're obligated to return any changes you make back to the community. And so the reason all of these large, very successful companies use this code is because it's better. It is technically superior to what they could design themselves within sort of their closed box. And it doesn't matter how smart their engineers are or how many of them there are. There's always going to be more smarter people and more people out on the outside that can help your company. Now, the, the open source aspect, of course, obviously doesn't mean that it's anti-business. You have all these monster corporations uh, making a lot of money off of open source software. Uh, but in the olden days, or kind of, you know, 10 years ago or so, the, they said, well, if we open source software works so well, why don't we have open source hardware? And the open source advocates were kind of like, well, in the software world, you can trade programs for essentially for free. You know, you're just transmitting data that's almost free. But in the hardware world, we're talking about actual physical stuff, and that's going to cost money. And that was before 3D printing. So now, with 3D printing, we can trade stuff. There's a lot of money to be made here. Uh, maybe I could take, take your attention to Red Hat. It's a billion dollar a year company. Their product, which is just a version of Linux, is free. You can download it off the internet. You can even burn DVDs and sell them if you'd like. But the reason that, say, Michigan Tech uh, pays them a good chunk of money is for their service. They've changed the business model where they give the product away for free, but then they offer the service to make sure that it runs right or works for your application. And that, I think, is going to be what we're seeing in the, sort of the physical space as well, where many of the products, we can almost drive the cost into the floor. So let me show you how that's done. One of the first open source hardware projects uh, to ever come about is the Arduino. The Arduino is a very simple microcontroller, and it was put together by Italian professors that were design professors. And what they were trying to do is have their students automate product, 
projects so that they could have, you know, like kinetic sculptures and things like that. And, you know, back in the day, say 10 or 15 years ago, if you wanted to do something to say like automate an arm, that was a, that was a PhD thesis. That was a significant level of hardship in order to be able to make, you know, some, to be able to take in information from the environment, say a temperature, and have it do something to the environment, say open a hand. With the Arduino, I can teach a third grader how to do this in half an hour. And that was their goal. Their goal was to let their design students work on the design of whatever their projects were and not kind of fumble through the electronics. So it made it extremely easy to use. Now this microcontroller is completely open source. The code, the schematics, the design, all of it is published free. If you want to build one for yourself from scratch, you're free to do that. Uh, but you can also buy one from them. And they run between $20 and $50. And it sort of depends on sort of how many ports it has or how useful it is. Now, it makes prototyping of all electronics extremely easy. So if we apply an Arduino to some simple science projects, uh, we can make an oscilloscope, which is kind of a key technology for uh, doing any kind of electrical engineering. And you can make a very, very cheap and inexpensive one for $20, the laptop that you already have on an Arduino. Um, perhaps if you're a biologist, you can make a pH meter. Again, for much less than it costs to normally make, a, to, to buy a commercial pH meter. And it's using that same prototyping platform so that if you get tired of it, or maybe you want to do something a little bit more sophisticated, like uh, say log the pH, and uh, log the oxidation induction potential and the temperature of an experiment you're working on, you can do that quite easily. Uh, the, the applications of this open source electronic prototyping platform have expanded greatly. So let's say you're into replicating DNA. Now there's an open source PCR. It costs $600, basically cutting the cost of PCR by a factor of 10 down. And you can see it's still crude. It's still like the beginning. This is kind of like a, a hacker or a maker project uh, for the DIY bio crowd. By far, the most impressive thing done with an Arduino was to create the first open source 3D printer. Now, we, we've talked a lot about 3D printing and how it's been around for a long time. You know, the 3D printing technology is at least 30 years old. Why is it that suddenly we're hearing about this? In my opinion, the main reason that we're hearing about it now is because of the RepRap project. RepRap stands for Self-Replicating uh, Rapid Prototyping System. Uh, the one on the left is the first one. And you can see all the parts that are in white were printed on the machine itself. So it's capable of partial self-replication. And it uses an Arduino as the brain to control it. All a 3D printer that does uh, fused filament uh, fabrication really is, is three, three axes and something to heat and control your filament. And so uh, a professor in, in Britain came up with the RepRap project. And rather than patent it and kind of keep everybody else out of the, the playground for 20 years, he put it up on the web. Then hundreds of people, myself included, uh, began to build and experiment with it and make it better and better. And that has led to dozens, and I think we're over 100 companies now, that are selling some version or variant of the RepRap technology. And that's why you've seen the cost go from hundreds of thousands of dollars to print simple plastic parts down to under $1,000. So on the right-hand side are a couple of my students working with our first kind of RepRap, the version one, which is just slightly different than the original. Uh, but because this is open source technology and there's so many people working on it all over the world, it's evolved. And it's evolved much faster than we're used to seeing sort of in the, the product lifespan of, of other things that, we're, that, that we buy. And so this is the second version. And what you can, can note about it is that it's easier to build, there's less pieces, it costs less, the quality is better, and it prints faster. But it's still a little bit hard, and so this was a couple years ago. And so this is where I think the RepRap um, evolved to the point where it could actually become useful. And this, uh, I think more than any, this picture captures everything. The computer that you see in that picture is a disk card. Michigan Tech felt that the the program or the, the computer was so old that you couldn't run modern software packages. You couldn't run Windows on it. It got clunky. So what we did is we took a bunch of discard computers. We tore out the, the old operating system, and we put on a version of light Linux. Uh, there's Debian. There's Mint. There's Ubuntu. There's a whole slew of different versions of Linux that are all available for free that allow you to run old computers and do the things that you would never be able to do uh, sort of in the proprietary software world. In this case, we're running OpenSCAD. OpenSCAD is a script-based CAD package. So for those of you that maybe are, n are not mechanical engineers and you're not familiar with CAD, but maybe you've had a little bit of programming experience, this is definitely the package for you. So you literally, if you want to create objects, you program in, you say, I would like to create a cube of these dimensions, and it makes it for you. You can make very complex objects. In the picture, what you're looking at is a parametric 
automated filter wheel changer. Now this was something that I needed for my own lab. My lab actually is a solar cell lab. That's where, well, it's not anymore. It used to be mostly a solar cell lab. And then as we got into 3D printing, it's now become almost a complete 3D printing lab and we still do some solar stuff. But in this case, we had a, a piece of technology. What a filter wheel does is it turns filters in the path of light. And so we're interested in shooting light of different colors at a solar cell and looking at its efficiency. And my automated filter wheel broke. The, it cost $2,500 to replace, which is irritating, but what was extremely irritating was, was a five-week lead time to get the part. And so in that five weeks, we designed our own using OpenSCAD and then printed it off of a third-generation RefRef. Our version of the filter wheel changer is not only superior to every other one on the market because it's parametric, you can change, for instance, the number of filters or the size of the filters. You have complete control over the speed and the changing of the, the filters in your, your system, but it also only cost us 50 bucks. So we took a $2,500 scientific tool that was custom and perfect and made it for $50. This is kind of the, th the 3.1 version of our RepRap. We did this to make it easy to build. And so we ran a seminar for high school teachers last year where we built 3D printers that cost less than 600 bucks that a teacher could build in 24 hours. Our personal record is two of my students can put it together for five hours, and that's pretty good. We're reducing the number of parts again. We're still improving the quality, um, but we can do better. So this is the, the current version of the open source RepRap that my group uses. Now there's probably 100 different versions of RepRaps. Uh, the reason that this one is, is nice is it's a, a Delta bot. So Delta bots are used in the electronics industry as pick and place robots because they can move extremely quickly. And so all we have on the end of it is something to heat the nozzle and the drive gear are, is kind of housed off, off site, pushed through a Bowden cable. So this particular Delta uh, can be built for eight hours uh, for under $500 of parts. Again, it's completely open source, all open source software, hardware, firmware, everything is available for everybody for free. For the first time, uh, that I got to use 3D printing was when I, I was, I think I was six years into a, being a professor and we finally got one in the university and I was making um, solar powered computers for the developing world. And uh, even just having that ability was awesome, but the costs were still prohibitive. And so I, I couldn't really use it for a lot of things. It was for the, the little laptop case, it was 65 bucks, which is, puts it out of the price range of people in the developing world. And the, the technology now that RepRap is here, I can build that same case for under five bucks. And it makes it possible to start to think about actually having all of our equipment as digital designs and being printable. And so that's what having an open source lab is about. Now, why would a scientist want to spend his or her time and money designing scientific equipment? So this, this kind of cartoon gives you an idea. So the, the, the scientist at the top uh, develops a very simple design uh, for holding, say, some chemicals. And she puts it up on the web, partially just out of the goodness of her heart to help other scientists, but partially for her own gain. Because then other scientists from around the world will hack it, and they will make more complicated versions of it, or things that complement it, such as a test tube rack or a, a simple um, spinner, so that she can start to take advantage of other people using the open source paradigm. Now, this particular example actually happened, where someone made a very simple design, and then the next step is people started to make centrifuges based around it. So the one on the left is my favorite. It's the Dremelfuge. It's a simple chuck that you can print with, I don't know, five cents of plastic, and you attach it to a Dremel drill. Now, centrifuges normally cost between a few hundred to a few thousand dollars. Ultra centrifuges are definitely a few thousand dollars. And if you get the high-end Dremel, which is like 60 bucks, you can make yourself an ultra centrifuge with that simple plastic part. If you want something to sit on your desk, you know that you're gonna pay a little bit more, uh, maybe a few dollars. Uh, for the electronics and the, the shielding of it, but you, you basically have cut the cost of doing centrifuging uh, uh, down by an order or two orders of magnitude. We found that the same sort of uh, cut rate prices for everything in everything that we looked at. Uh, so my, my group developed the open source optics library. So if you're interested in optics of any kind from the high school level all the way up to, to pretty fancy physics at the university uh, level, one of the, the irritating things is every time you want a, a me simple mechanical component, it costs you like 50 bucks. And this is from filter holders to lens holders, uh, that uh, lab jack down at the bottom right. I mean, you can get lab jacks you know, from China for a few dollars to a few hundred dollars, but the really nice ones are extremely expensive. I got a quote for a lab jack from a company that I work with for $1,000. And that made me so mad that I hired a high school student to make me the $5 lab jack 
in the bottom right. It's been downloaded thousands of times and I'm assumed being used all over the world. It is not the best lab jack on the market, but it's good enough. All a lab jack does is move things up and down and in optics you want to move something up and down in the path of, of light and so you really don't need a thousand dollar anything for it. You can make very sophisticated things like the Michelson inter interferometer. Uh, optical rails, for example, cost or $380 a meter. Uh, open beam costs $12 a meter. And so you can outfit, uh, say, a physics lab uh, for a few hundred dollars instead of $15,000 uh, with everything that you could want. The other beautiful part about it is when you're designing uh, optical experiments, you often don't know what you need. Uh, so if you look at the, the kind of components in the upper left and upper right, those are simple chopper wheels. They cost $35 a piece. And when you're designing an optical experiment, you usually buy a whole slew of them because you're going to have to change them in to see kind of uh, what frequency of light works the best for your given experiment. But with 3D printing, you can print out any number that you want. You don't have to have a box of 10 of them sitting there. You can pick the one that you actually need. And again, of course, it's only a few cents to print it out. So there's lots more that can be done with it. Linear actuators, uh, uh, lens holders. Uh, you can make a mirror grinding machine to make your own mirrors, say, if you wanted to make telescopes for a class. Uh, there's all different kinds of microscope adapters that have been developed where you can turn kind of the old, funky, uh, simple optical microscopes into digital microscopes. And this is one of my favorite uh, applications that we're going to be building on. This is an ellipsometer. So the way an ellipsometer works is you have polarized light that you bounce off a surface. Now this is a very simple one. It's already open source. It's just one wavelength of light, only one color. But if you have a spectroscopic ellipsometer, what you can do, you, you're looking at the change in polarization state as that light is bouncing off a surface and you're looking at the entire wavelength range, all the colors. You can start to pick out things like the void density, the band gap, the thickness of your layers, what the chemical properties are of your layers, just with that information. Now the magic behind it, the science behind it, so some delicious physics there, but all of the code is already open source. So this summer, I promise you, our lab will be making a spectroscopic ellipsometer that's completely 3D printable, uh, that has all open source code. And what this means is that even for people like doing new uh, material development in the 3D printing world, they can start to use an ellipsometer that normally costs over $100,000, and I guarantee you ours will cost only maybe $1,000 uh, for the high-end optics components. To give you an idea about how powerful using open source software is to do the CAD, consider this uh, simple shadow band for a pyranometer. So a shadow band for a pyranometer is used to separate uh, the amount of light coming from the sun so that you can get the global radiation or you can get the beam radiation that's just for what's directly coming from the sun. Again, normally you have to, to buy these. They cost a couple hundred dollars. This is a parametric one, and all the code to make that object you can see on the screen. So it's not very difficult code. It's something that you, know, you could teach an eighth grader. It's, it's actually fairly simple, but it's parametric. So you only have to change one number in the code for the, the variables to make it for your specific application. Now, uh, Thingiverse has done a very nice uh, thing for the entire maker community in that they've taken the code from OpenSCAD and made it so they could put it in their customizer app. So now someone doesn't even need to understand the basic code as long as they can change a number for a screen, say for this uh, perforated cylinder that you might use, uh, say for a, a funneling or a, uh, a filtration experiment. You can change the number of holes, the size of the holes, how far they are spaced apart, and you don't need to know anything. All you do is change the numbers or the sliders in the customizer app, make the STL, and then print it out on your favorite printer. You can make much more complicated things. So this is a planetary gearbox written in OpenSCAD in our lab. It's completely parametric. If you want to do something like uh, you saw this awesome clay printer uh, here on the outside, and they need something like a 100 to 1 gearbox on it. Well, now you can print that gearbox. You don't have to go through all the pain and suffering of designing that gearbox. You simply put in 100 for your gear ratio, and it automatically sizes everything for you, and you print out the parts. Now, the real savings uh, for scientists are when you're going to do something that no one's ever done before. And so uh, one of the projects that my lab was looking at was to make a solar water pasteurizer. And so the idea is you'd have a developing community that needed clean drinking water and you'd heat the water up to a pasteurization temperature to make it safe to drink. So this works for biological contamination but not chemical contamination. And we build a prototype and you know you, everybody that's done prototyping of anything knows that your first version is sort of gold plated and, and costs a ridiculous amount of money and then you can kind of push the price down as, as you go. And so our gold plated, plated version worked. It was awesome. It could easily handle the, the drinking water for a family. Uh, we could push down the price on all of the components except the heat exchanger. And the heat exchanger cost $250, and we figured we had to get the entire device under $25 for anybody to even look at it. 
and that just wasn't simply going to work. And so if you want to mm, decrease the cost of something, you can get rid of the material, or you can change to a simpler material, a less costly material. So we started to look at polymers. Now, anyone that even understands basic thermodynamics would know that you know, we don't normally make heat exchangers out of polymers because they don't conduct heat very well. But it turns out if you make the layers of the polymer extremely thin, they don't do so bad. And so we started to work on making microchannel expanded uh, polymer heat exchangers. And you know, for our first one, of course, we did the gold-plated version. Nobody in the US could make it for us, so we went to this firm in Germany. And it cost $3,000 to get our first polymer heat exchanger, which was great. And it was awesome. And it worked. But there's no way we're going to make hundreds of versions of this to try to figure out the, the exact geometry. We just couldn't afford it. And so at about the same time, there was a grad student in Canada that had just open sourced a laser cutter. And we looked at the design, and we're like, you know what? I bet we could make that into the laser welder that we need to do our heat exchanger. And by the way, this is an additive. I, I've been thinking about this. I never thought of it this way before, but it is additive manufacturing. What we're doing is laying down layers of garbage bag and laser centering them together in order to make a heat exchanger. So we pulled over 70% effectiveness for a heat exchanger made out of garbage bags um, based on an open source laser cutter that we printed out our own components for to turn into a laser welding system. This one device saves more money than it costs us to build it every time I used it. We've saved tens of thousands of dollars easily just on the work that we've done on this particular project. Uh, if you're into outdoor stuff, all different kinds of weather stations have already been open sourced, uh, from tipping buckets to, to do uh, rain gauges to wind, wind speeds. Uh, all of this is already done and available for everybody, uh, taking the cost of doing outdoor weather monitoring down by at least a factor of 10. Uh, pipette racks and even the pipette men themselves have been open sourced. There's all different kinds of 3D printed ones now, using everything, say, from like balloons. They're pushing microliters, so this is not, these are not toys. These are actual real scientific tools where you're saving hundreds of, hundreds of dollars by using them. Then you could start to combine the ideas of putting the microcontroller, the open source electronics, with the 3D printed parts. Colorimeters are, are basically uh, devices to look at the color of something. They're often used in water testing to find specific contaminants. And so we, were we built an open source colorimeter. Normally they cost about $2,000. Ours costs about 50, and it's primarily, again, for the electronics for the, the microcontrolling system. And as you can see by the, the graph on the bottom right, ours is basically equivalent to anything that you can buy for $2,000 or less. What makes ours better, though, is that instead of having to use a certain standard, say for the test tube size or the cuvette size, because it uses a 3D printer to make the case, you can change it to anything that you'd like. And so now you can use it for multiple different things. Uh, say, for example, you wanted to also, and besides colorimeter, you wanted to look at nephilometry, and so you wanted to measure turbidity. And now you can do that. All you had to do was add another LED, another sensor, and change the, the printed components which of course is extremely easy. So in this particular version, we made it handheld and somewhat portable. Next version, we'll go to a smaller Arduino, maybe throw on some solar cells so it's solar powered. And now you have a water testing equipment that replaces at least $4,000 of proprietary kind of uh, water testing um, tools that you would use, say, in development projects to look at whether or not someone needed their water uh, to be pur purified. And it can be all built for under $50. Syringe pumps. Syringe pumps go from between a few thousand to over $5,000. The cheaper ones are a few hundred, uh, but they're not good. And so this is using a Raspberry Pi to do uh, open source syringe pumps, anything that you like, multiple ones. You can do it for things like electro spinning. You can use it for biology labs. You can basically use it for whatever you like. It's using the same basic driving features as the RepRap, so all you're doing is pushing a stepper motor and using all printed plastic parts to fit any of the syringe that you like. So again, you could use this for something like uh, clay printing, or you could use it for uh, sort of very high-end scientific applications. Uh, all the test tube racks in the world have already been designed. Uh, the magnetic racks are probably the most important commercially. Printing a single magnetic rack and buying the magnets and installing them yourself with super glue will justify the cost of buying a rep wrap. And not just like you know the super cheap versions that we make. You can buy a nice TAS like the ones that are uh, displayed out here in the foyer. Uh, we're going to higher and higher end objects. Public Labs has developed spectrometers that you can print out and attach to your cell phone. And so you can start to do things like chemical analysis um, wherever you happen to be. Uh, Sensorica is a nonprofit group in, based in Canada. Uh, they're making high end force displacement sensors. These are extremely expensive, uh, very specialized parts. 
normally you wouldn't have access to and you can make them yourself uh, with the M3 nuts and screws left over from your last RepRap build and a bunch of printed plastic parts. And it doesn't stop there. It's getting, uh, what the open source scientific community is doing is driving it forward. It's going to more and more expensive things from fully printable microscopes to ones that are completely automated. So the University of Cambridge has this completely automated optical microscope. They normally retail for around 80 grand and you can build theirs from for less than uh, 10 times that. And there's no reason to stop there. Uh, there's already a very large open source community based around the imaging software that you need for scanning probe microscopy. So things like atomic force microscopes, scanning tunneling microscopes, uh, where you're actually resolving matter down to the atomic level. Uh, there have been some tries at making a 3D printed AFM. To the best of my knowledge, nobody's done it yet, but it's coming. You're going to start to be able to do nanotechnology built with components that you can print off of your cheap 3D printer uh, for almost no cost. Uh, for instance, you can turn your cell phone into a completely functional optical microscope, a digital microscope. Those are all 3D printed components. The only thing that's not there that's not 3D printed besides the phone are some lenses that if you go down to Walgreens, you can ask them for the lenses from the disposable cameras. I need four of them and now you've got yourself a pretty nice little microscope. Which brings up this idea of citizen science. You know, right now, a large majority of the peer-reviewed literature is, is sort of protected from the rest of the world. And you can't read it anyway because it costs 35 to $50 per article, uh, but you can't participate because you can't afford the tools. And so particularly in the developing world, you wonder like why is it that everybody in the developing world is only interested in theory? Where are all the experimentalists? Like how is it possible that the entire continent of Africa has almost no experimentalists? Well, it's cost. Because scientific equipment costs so much, we lose a lot of the best scientists in the world to theoreticians. And not that I have anything against theoreticians, uh, but it would be nice if everybody that wanted to do an experiment could. And it, as we're using 3D printing to push down the cost of doing experimental science to almost nothing, everybody can be a scientist. So I like this uh, uh, example uh, quite a lot. So this is a Geiger counter uh, that you can build yourself, uh, uses a printable case, and you say, well, why would I want that? Well, let's just say there was an accident where you lived and you wanted to know what the radiation levels were, but the industry that, uh, the industry that, was, um, that made the accident doesn't want to tell you anything, and the government is kind of a little bit cagey on what the actual numbers are. Uh, what you could do is with all of your friends uh, from all over the world, people that you never met, just put up what the readings are where you live. And in this, so this was uh, during Fukushima where the citizens of Japan started to open source their own readings. They are already selling cell phones with Geiger counters built in. We are going, we're quickly moving to the point where we don't need the EPA to tell us what the results are. We'll be able to read it for ourselves off of the phones in our pockets and probably off of some 3D printed components. This is the future. Uh, so we, I, I love the uh, little future movie. You got me all excited and then we didn't get 3D printed lunch. Um, but this is real. So this is a tricorder. Uh, it has over 20 different sensors in it now. So it can like look at magnetic fields, the color of light, uh, temperature, or, or the humidity, all that kind of stuff. Fits into the palm of your hand, 3D printing case uh, based off of Debian Linux. And the next version, I promise you, will have my little attachment so you can start to put in water samples or anything that can fit into a test tube. It's open source, it's got a large community going around it, and it's getting better and better each and every day. Now that's just plastic. So that's what we could do with plastic. And as we've, we've heard already, uh, we're starting to look as a community, the, the additive manufacturing community, at functional materials. Uh, already uh, scientists from a whole slew of different labs, including my own, have printed in conductive polymers. And so if you can start to print in a polymer, uh, then you could think about actually doing something like printing on a, on a board. And if you could print a board, why wouldn't you print an Arduino? And if you can print an Arduino, then there's only a little bit more difficulty in printing a stepper motor. And at that point, we have a completely self-replicating 3D printer. Now, it won't put itself together. You still need to assemble it, uh, but it's coming. And if we can do that, could we make a smartphone for ourselves? Maybe we couldn't in the beginning make the chips, uh, but you could buy the chips. They're pretty cheap and print out the boards and put the chips in yourself and do a little bit of soldering. And now you have a smartphone. Um, the next step, of course, is to do everything. And 
that's interesting, but what about the big stuff? What about the, the car parts or the bicycles, the hammers, chemical reaction wire? If I'm a scientist, I want to be able to do everything digitally. I want to, when I publish my papers and other people want to replicate my experiment, I want to share with them just not the data, just not the code, but also the digital designs of the experiment themselves so they can directly replicate them and immediately say, like, you know, those guys at Michigan Tech actually know what they're doing. And so to help this along a little bit, we open sourced the first metal 3D printer um, that is exceptionally low cost. So for $1,200, you can start printing out in steel. Now what this is, is it's sort of an upside down delta bot. So rather than move the head that's um, like all the printers that you see out here um, extruding some sort of material, we move the stage underneath it. And so we got a stage, it's insulated, and we put on a piece of metal, a sacrificial uh, substrate, and then we attach a MIG welder to it and start to build up steel objects. So we've done proof of concept, we've already made useful parts, uh, a good example of this is a sprocket. And you look at the, the surface finish on that and be like, yeah, that's not that interesting. I was talking to some engineers at lunch and they're like, ah, you know, we need a micron resolution to even think about doing your stuff. Fair enough. Um, for my application now, it's good enough and it's getting better. We just run a grant from America Makes to start pushing the resolution down and get it to an actually manufacturable product that people would actually want to buy. And you say, well, why are you making sprockets in a, in a lab that does solar energy and 3D printing? Well, the reason that we use the sprockets is for our recycle bots. A recycle bot is a device that turns waste plastic into 3D printer filament. So you take your milk jugs, you clean them out, cut them up, throw them through an office shredder, like a cross-cut simple office shredder that you would use to shred a DVD, and you get this kind of uh, mess. Throw it into the hopper. The hopper has an auger, simple wood auger that you can pick up at any, any hardware store. And the little motor in the, the front of the uh, system, is that's just a windshield wiper motor. It turns the auger, pushes it through a hot zone, you get out your 3D printing filament. We're making filament in our lab for 10 cents a kilogram. You're buying 3D printing filament now, at sort of the best prices is maybe $35 a kilogram. So all of the economic stuff that people are talking about, driving down the cost of 3D printed parts, this annihilates it. You're never going to come close to that. I'd, I'd be very interested to see if anybody has done it. And there are already uh, a slew of companies that have commercialized some form of the RecycleBot. Uh, like Philostruder was a uh, Kickstarter project, and you can buy their version of it for a couple hundred dollars. It pays for itself in about 10 kilograms of plastic. Uh, so it might be useful to any of you that are, are doing a lot of printing. Our end goal of this, of this project and what we're doing, the America Makes Grant is meant to do, besides making something that's sort of ready for showtime, is to be able to take aluminum cans, add whatever small amounts of metals we need to do to make it so that they don't crack when they're um, welded, and be able to print useful objects from the waste product in your uh, garbage can. So I think this is, I'm, I've drank a lot of Kool-Aid on this stuff, so I think this is a great idea. I think that this is going to be how science is done in the future. Uh, when I can make the same tools that my colleagues are using for a hundredth of the cost, I can't help but beat them. I mean, it, it's, it costs me less money for equipment, so I can spend more money on graduate students. Uh, I can spend more money going to conferences. I can try new and more interesting ideas. And so I, I think as a, as a nation, if we want to remain competitive, we need to start thinking about from a sort of national standpoint, what are policies we need to put in place to drive this forward? And so the first thing is we should start to identify what, where the op opportunities are from a strategic national interest for a high return on the investment for open source scientific hardware. And what do I mean by that? I mean, right now, the National Science Foundation knows exactly how many X we import from Germany because of their high quality standards. If we could make an open source version, and even if you need to invest a little bit to get it, say you invest a million dollars, but we're buying $20 million of that stuff a year, it pays for itself in a year. Uh, then the federal funding should be used to actually create this scientific equipment. And I, this is, a couple people have already touched on this, but the quality of the 3D prints varies fairly radically, even from printers from the exact same company. It depends on who's using them, how they're using the slicing, how experienced they are, what settings they're using. And so that free online catalog of open source scientific hardware made available to everyone should be validated. So it's nice that Michigan Tech makes some, um, you know, pipette men, but maybe somebody some, from Stanford should make sure that they actually work and are actually as good as, that we, as we say they are. And once they've given that seal of approval, then everybody can start from that point. They don't have to reinvent the wheel. They can build off of where we already uh, have gotten to. 
Uh, to drive this forward even faster, the federal government should start for all of the organizations, basically everybody that makes up America Makes, should start having policy preferences for open source hardware. Now, why would you want to do that? One of the primary advantages to having open source hardware is if something breaks, you immediately can fix it. You can immediately go to the next stage. So for instance, the, the TAS makes it possible to print out its upgrades. So when their next version comes out, you print, out, print them out, you don't have to buy them from them, you go to the next stage. And that makes their printer much more valuable than anything that comes in a closed box that you can't get to. And that's true of 3D printers, but it's especially true of scientific equipment. I have a $250,000 paperweight because I don't have access to the code for a piece of equipment that broke. Company went out of business. I'm hosed. So is every other person that bought their equipment. If it was open source, I could at least have a chance at turning that back into a useful functional device. Finally, we should be supporting makerspaces in schools, uh, definitely all the public universities, and we should really start thinking about the high schools and the grade schools. There's no reason there shouldn't be a 3D printer in every school. The, they can easily pay for themselves just upgrading their science labs from things that have already been designed and open sourced. So if you're interested in any of the work that my group does, the, the link at the top, afropedia.org, uh, most has everything that we do. Our method sections, designs, the code, the open source hardware, build instructions for everything that I talked about, literature reviews, and the open source lab book. Uh, we got a couple chapters for free, and I made a deal with Elsevier that soon all of the chapters will be for free, so you can download the book for free. So I thank you very much for your time and attention, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Does Marty McFly work in your lab? No. <laughs> Fle flex capacitor? Well, we'll, we'll get to that next. Uh, <laughs> I, I believe he can build the flex capacitor. I really do. Who's got some questions? Right there. Online catalog of open source stuff. I mean, right now, I mean, the one community MakerBot has the Thingiverse, and the number of things on there is huge. What you're advocating is maybe something like for scientific equipment, the kind of stuff that you've been doing, everybody else could be collaborating on. Yes, yeah, so, so Thingiverse is great, and there's maybe a, at least a couple dozen competitors that have, it, and they're usually supported by 3D, manufact 3D printing manufacturers. Uh, but I think one of the things that um, the MakerBot team is missing they have a little paid section where it's kind of like, this is stuff that we say is good and we'll work with the MakerBot immediately. We need to have that same sort of concept specifically for scientific tools. And I think, you know, a company could do it, but it would be really nice if it was supported sort of at the national level so that we would, I think we can get a lot more leverage out of it that way. Much more leverage. Questions? There you go. Uh, well, I was a little bit curious about the funding model. A lot of the work that you've done, is it funded sort of through an attitude on other grant-funded projects that have another goal, or are you directly getting funding for doing this work? So, so both. Um, oftentimes, I'll design tools that we're using for the lab to make another goal. So a lot of the scientific equipment is, that we've done is actually to, to look at characterized solar cells. Uh, but also, we've started to come up with kind of new business models, where, for instance, uh, we're working with this company called nitrate.com, and they make uh, some sort of fancy enzyme to look for nitrates. And that's what they sell as a product. But they were also selling this little colorimeter, essentially. And it was terrible. It was yay big and was slow and bulky. And they were selling it for $250. And I'm like, I can do all of that for way less than that. Uh, why don't you support us to make a really nice open source colorimeter? You can give them away for free to your customers, but you make your money back in making it uh, in selling your enzymes. And so they've, they like the idea. And so I think there's a lot of opportunity there to find the coupling between companies that are making something else uh, to support open source hardware development. One last question over here. Um, organizations like uh, the Gates Foundation and other uh, relief efforts for like you know, third world nations on developing some of these products. Uh, oh, that, that's a great point. So there's certainly a lot of interest in making appropriate technologies uh, that are 3D printable for development. And so you've got open source ecology, you've got a bunch of universities working on it. The Gates Foundation isn't that interested in open source. I don't know why, but they haven't <laughs> felt the love yet. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> As an IBM room, that's really funny. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay. Any one more question? L last one, way back in the corner. Young man in the green. 
platform? Uh, for a lot of the lab materials that you're 3D printing, like say a centrifuge or a pipette rack, how well does the plastic hold up for that sort of use? That is a great question. So depending on what you're doing, the simple ABS of PLA is just fine. Uh, we have tried to make ABS reaction wear, and actually I can save everybody in here a lot of time, don't do it. Um, you need something that's a little bit more chemically stable. We did like a redox reaction and it basically blew out in between each of the layers. And so the, our solution is to start to print in silicone. And so we have a caulk extruder uh, that basically is, the, it works on the same premise as the metal 3D printer. We're removing the stage underneath the giant caulk gun and printing out in silicone. And so we can print reaction wear like that. We've also printed um, like ABS silicone sort of hybrids. So you use the ABS for the structural support and the silicone for the chemical compatibility. And so, you know, we are just barely scratching the surface on materials uh, for 3D printing now. There's, it's wide open. There are millions of things to work on. Um, and I, yeah, it's a very, very exciting time to be a scientist in additive manufacturing. Thank you ever so much, Josh. That was Thank great. You. Good job.